hear me fine? Yes. Yeah, okay. everything's just fine now. I won't hazard plugging in this microphone because if, if the audio is good enough, then. Yeah, no, it's just fine. Uh, how are you doing today? I'm good. How are you? Good, good. Um, I really appreciate you joining me. Um, I came across some of your writings and everything through Twitter and a lot of the subjective experiences you wrote about from psychedelics and at least um, from a philosophical view of kind of transcending nihilism as a whole mm -hmm. dynamic resonated with me a lot. And a lot of the subjective aspects of your experiences kind of spoke to me a lot. So I thought it was pretty neat that there was somebody out there integrating a lot of this in the Christian viewpoint. Um, because when we talk about meditation or psychedelics or these oneness type experiences, a lot of times it's associated with Eastern stuff. Sure. And so, and so, um, when, uh, whenever it's usually associated with Eastern, it's Christianity is kind of not seen in the light of that. Um, but these experiences, it doesn't really have a lot of integrative and integrative component to bring it into the Christian viewpoint. Um, and so I just wanted to kind of ask you, to start, uh, I know you've probably recounted your psychedelic experiences quite a bit, so I don't want to make you have to do that too much, but I wanted to ask you what about um, kind of the psychedelic experiences or the oneness experiences that you've had led you to Christianity kind of as the prevailing viewpoint that stuck with you as opposed to some of the other Eastern traditions? Hmm, yeah, that's, that's a great question. It was definitely a very long <laughs> journey. Um, so I'm actually, I'm writing a book about this right now. I'm under contract to write a book right now. So I have been thinking about it a great deal. And, um, you know, I think with psychedelics, like I wholeheartedly believed in, I would have said that I believed in God, but I think I wholeheartedly believed in psychedelics as a path to, path to God at the very least. And in a way, um, worshiped them or, Perhaps I should say, like, worshipped the um, that the idea of that unitive experience of that ego death, that ego loss experience. And so I found with psychedelics that there was very much a law of diminishing returns at work. Yeah. Like, and over over the long term, and I was also um, pretty interested and in, and practiced to an extent meditation i was very very devoted to yoga as a spiritual practice um both the physical practice and also the meditative practice of yoga and um i just found over the long term like those diminishing returns it seemed like the the mountaintop experience the high that i was seeking um didn't really come to me anymore and i think also i longed for and i was raised somewhat nominally Christian. So there was a little bit of a foundation there. I wouldn't say um, it had a lot of depth to it. And I, I don't say that to criticize my parents at all. It was just, you know, they, they were raised with a lot of depth and they both grew in their Christian faith as they grew older. But my childhood just, that really wasn't um, a big part of who we were as a family. And, um, but I, I did, I found myself after several years of using psychedelics frequently and meditating and practicing yoga three times a week, I found myself dissatisfied with the idea of an impersonal God or, and like I said, I would have, I would have said that I believed in God, but I, I viewed God as this kind of distant life force, or I viewed God as, as that unitive experience itself of oneness and the dissolution of boundaries. Like I regarded it that in itself as God. And I remember I had I had a friend at the time who's also very into psychedelics and he he kind of enjoyed um introducing other people to psychedelics. And I remember he told me one of his friends that he introduced the psychedelics um when they were peaking on LSC. He he said to his friend, like, this is God. This is God. Whatever anyone else has told you about God. Is a lie like this is God and I think I look back on that and think that was really my viewpoint but I think after a time um, of that and also I mean the bad trips were part of it like bad trips were never enough to make me want to quit psychedelics but they do um, leave a mark you know they leave a scar and I had some some pretty bad ones and I think that found like 
led me to wondering about the character of God. Like if this is God, like this experience or this state of being is God, then who, like, what does that say about who God is? And I found myself longing for, I guess, a personal God, like a, a God who redeems, a God who's not just like an amorphous life force who might be benevolent sometimes, but also can be um, very male malevolent in a way. Um, and that was along the lines of those bad trips. Like you never really quite knew what you were going to get. And so I think it was just, just a journey of beginning to question who I had assumed God was, which my conception of God was very much filtered through my psychedelic experiences, but also filtered through the Eastern literature I was reading. And I also read a lot of literature from the 60s, like literature that came out of, and philosophy that came out of the psychedelic movement. And a lot of that was probably a pretty surface level, you know, like a regurgitation of various, you know, Eastern mystic traditions. Um, it was really to Alan Watts, Ram Dass was probably my very favorite. Um, so it was just a journey of questioning that and also things um, occurring in my life. I think, I don't know if you read the piece that I wrote for Fathom, I had a childhood friend who um, was raised Christian and remained a Christian. And she, and I would see her periodically after we both had children. And um, she had a toddler daughter, she was two years old, who passed away from leukemia. And it was very rapid, like from diagnosis to her death. It was very rapid. And I think witnessing that and witnessing her and her husband navigate that with such grace and such faith, it just made me wonder, like, I, I don't, no God like that, you know, like, I don't know of something that could sustain me through that kind of catastrophic loss. And so I think that that had a big impact on me as well. So the, sorry, that's kind of a <laughs> roundabout answer to that question. No, I like it. Um, I think it kind of beautifully captures kind of similar experiences, maybe for a lot of people who've yeah. progressed from, at least from the psychedelic standpoint. And then a lot of times it leads people to that Eastern impersonal connection with this ethereal God that's that's yeah. not really attainable or you can't really build a relationship with. And so right. there, and I, I had spoken with someone who said some similar um, language to what you just said and, and the way he kind of explained it was this decoupling of narrative and truth where yeah, you, yeah. You, you feel okay. the, you feel like the transcendental aspect of the oneness state. But if you put too much credence or too much weight on that experience as defining your moral landscape at that point, you lose this, de you decouple your life from some kind of ultimate story. And, mm, and, depending on, yeah. and depending on kind of how you interpret what you had just said, it seems kind of like that to you or that impersonal nature of, of God that's kind of presented in the Eastern Vedic text and in yogic texts and things like that does generally appear to be a little bit far away or remote um, yes. from yeah. ourselves. And so, um, and like what you said at the end about suffering or about going through something very traumatic, yeah. Those those religions and those texts did never seem to me to want to transform or give you a, a method by which to um, transmutate that suffering into something that yeah. is viably useful moving forward, as opposed to taking you the opposite direction. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, that's really insightful. Um, and so I think that that um, it's important that people probably a lot of times I wanted to ask you just because we had gotten to this point, like, did you find any wisdom or any uh, insights that helped you not just through psychedelics, but through literature and, and philosophy, mainly outside the religious text. Did you ever have any um, desire to look into Plato and Socrates and Aristotle? I know a lot of times psychedelic experiences lead people to that, that genre. And I wanted to see kind of how you, how you look at platonic texts and how they relate to your view of Christianity. You know, that's one thing. And I, I went back and I was listening to some of your previous podcasts a couple of days ago. And I know, um, like Plato has kind of made a comeback, I guess that's kind of the way to put it. But I remember reading some in college and I actually like have not any time in the recent years read any Plato. So if you like, could you give me kind of like a, I know this is difficult, but like a rundown of like what the interest is now and like what are the primary ideas that are, that are floating around? 
Yeah, absolutely. In fact, I, I'm kind of uh, far from being a scholar on Plato, but I'm more than happy to kind of give you what um, what I've come to learn from it. And um, I know you had mentioned too, I think, I can't remember which interview, but I've listened to a few of yours that were really neat. And one of them you had mentioned, I believe your husband had kind of had a, uh, whenever he was coming back towards Christianity, he found himself more in the Eastern Orthodox, yeah. um, the, the Desert Fathers, I believe you mentioned. Um, yeah. And uh, I found that really a neat aspect or component of your experience because having your partner pursue that route, that's what I found to be the most platonic version of Christianity out there. Okay. Um, okay. And, and, and so it's kind of interesting to see somebody find the Desert Fathers and the, the writings of the Church Fathers, even in the primary Catholic Church, generally yeah. are are more tailored towards this um, this platonic view. But what it really seems to me to be is Plato kind of, and those um, Socrates and Aristotle more so looked at, they were trying to reverse this um, basically oneness and look at it more dualistically to where Plato was always assuming that, that God is out there and we're here and we're striving continually to build a relationship, to escape our bodies essentially, to eventually attain Godhood or, um, we're always transcending the body and transcending ourselves as we grow in a closer relationship to this transcendental symbol. So God wasn't necessarily this narrative creator of our, of our, of our lives, but more so we are fallen and always attempting to ascend higher. And so it's not this um, salvational view where you're, you're praying and then you're forgiven forever. And then there's not this continuing wrestling with God necessarily to get closer to his energy or his essence and so Plato more looked at it like that, that we can always build and strengthen a, an ever increasing relationship with the transcendental and that the body is kind of a, an entity that prevents that, that transcendence really. And so we're always yeah. finding ways to, and so that's, that's kind of where a lot of the psychedelic experiences merge with platonic writings is, is they, some, some even think that, you know, psychedelics had a factor to play in a lot of the Greek philosophy that was written. Okay. Um, so it kind of merges there, but, um, what I, what I kind of wanted to go back to, too, just is your mention of your friend's story or the anecdote. Mm -hmm. Have you seen the ability, I guess, coming back to Christianity? Was it was it a, um, a neat highlighting point of it for you, the idea of being able to restructure suffering into something that's transcendent and something that can help others that's not really given in a lot of other texts? Yeah, absolutely. And I always struggled with the idea of um, detachment that's very prevalent in Buddhist writings and also in yogic writings. I just struggled with that idea. It seemed, um, I don't know, as much as I would, I believed it was true. I mean, I guess I believed it was it was truthful and I um, thought I was attaining some degree of it through yoga and through meditation. Like it, it always... <laughs> Or I should say, perhaps it increasingly seemed seemed wrong to me. And like you said, that that was such a brilliant phrase that your friend used. That what was it? The decoupling of narrative. Of na yeah, and, narrative from truth, or truth from yes. narrative. Where you, yeah. Yes. Yes. And so it was like I had this narrative over here that I gleaned from my psychedelic psychedelic experiences, to an extent. But even um, I think my best psychedelic experiences, I should say, um, were deeply personal and deeply human. And they didn't like, um, they didn't embody that detachment and they didn't really necessarily embody that like absorption into the all or absorption into oneness. So even when I look back on that, I'm like, it didn't quite fit. Yet I was reading all these things about, you know, annihilating my ego and, um, and like I said, particularly when I encountered, um, you know, like the death, I remember, right, I think I wrote in that Fathom piece, like my worldview or my, you know, ideology that was just kind of a grab bag of all these different things, like did not have space for a dead toddler. Like I didn't know how to incorporate that. Like, I didn't know how to, um, yeah, it just didn't, it didn't add up to me. And yeah. so I think um, the reality of Jesus Christ was like so rich and novel. And that sounds like kind of a cheap word to use, but um, like the idea that God is not at all detached he's not at all distant in fact like he's so deeply personal and deeply immersed 
in um, and deeply invested in humankind that he came to earth and was incarnated and suffered that way. Like I, I and I just have come to believe, and I've I've said this to um, my brother, whom I love, of course, he's an agnostic leaning atheist, and and I've I've said this to him, and I've said this to a few other people. Like it is having you know, I guess plumbed the depths of my own personal psyche through psychedelics and having investigated um, all of, you know, these world religions and Eastern mysticism, like the story of Jesus Christ, the incarnation, you know, the life, the crucifixion, the resurrection is the only story that I find big enough to account <laughs> for everything. Um, it's the only story that I find satisfying enough. And I know some people argue like, well, that in itself doesn't necessarily make it true. But I think um, Frederick Buechner has this brilliant line. He says, um, sometimes wishing is the wings that the truth comes true on. And sometimes the truth is what sets us wishing for it. So I really think there's something, you know, to the reality that it is, it does seem to me like the only story big enough. It seems like the only story satisfying enough. And that was, yeah, incredibly transformative to me to be to like I felt liberated to view suffering the way that I always I guess like my heart always <laughs> intuitively longed to or intuitively sensed was was right you know but at the same time it was um it was like it was like a homecoming coming to Christianity it was like a homecoming and it was also like an entirely new world that I had to really like adjust to and I remember there were things we had started going to a Christian church and there were things that were just that were just absolutely befuddling to me like I remember hearing a sermon on Galatians when we first started going to church and I felt like the gist of the sermon was um I mean and I mean it kind of was like that there are no there are no rules like there are no like that we have freedom in the spirit you know and christ came to set us free and we have freedom in the spirit and we don't have to live by these rules and we, we don't live by the law we live by the spirit and for me coming from the traditions that i came from and the practices that i came from that was so scandalizing because i feel like i had i had lived by rules and um i mean on one hand like you said the that platonic idea of always um striving toward God makes sense. But I, I think there's also grace. <laughs> you know, I mean, there's so much grace. I think there's more grace than we can imagine or even comprehend. And so I feel like I had lived by rules and I had lived by my own effort and found it um, totally insufficient um, to, to reach God, I guess. Um, and I, I would go through different, all kinds of different permutations of dietary restrictions. And I was a raw vegan for a while and I would, um, I would fast and I would, but it, it was all like, um, it was all very rules based. Like it wasn't, I wasn't fasting, you know, I was fasting because I felt like it was within the rules. Like I felt like it was earning me something. I felt like it was getting me somewhere. Um, and so yeah, I'm sorry. Now I've forgotten the original question. <laughs> I hope I, I oh no, I'm not. Oh, I'm not sure there was. I think I was more <laughs> or less um, asking you to do exactly that. To kind of highlight okay. your kind of highlight your interpretation of the, the importance of suffering and the overcoming of it, and how that kind of. And it seems like a lot of times, um, or not. I mean, I, I had actually recently heard um, a speech by someone, and they kind of embodied or kind of linguistically said something similar to this and about suffering and about how we put the cross of Christ at the center of our, of the fabric of our society. And um, whether, whether or not you recognize that as a yeah. bad or a good thing, it is inherently the cross is associated with a lot of symbology and just a lot of symbols. Um, and it's interesting because like you had said, the, the personal nature of Jesus Christ be, being made man and having gone through the worst of the worst suffering any person should have ever gone through yeah. Um, and then descended to the depths of the worst and, and um, all of those kinds of things really, really um, put a bridge there between the personal God and, and the, the transcendental, non-visible, you know, man in the sky interpretation yeah. of God. Um, mm -hmm. And I find it interesting. It's like we uh, what this person had said in this lecture was something along the lines of 
we place the symbol of ultimate suffering at our at the centerfold of our society almost as a way to inoculate ourselves against the mm -hmm. tragedy of life um mm -hmm. the inherent nature of suffering the the most the most insufferable nature of christ is that he came to earth and was betrayed by his best friend was the most good anybody could have ever been and was put through the worst of the worst so pretty much all of the human tragedy is is encapsulated within just the story of one man uh at the worst of the worst and so yeah. i see that as an interesting feat or interesting facet of, of christianity is that it's not like the buddhists like you had said the buddhist texts take it to suffering is inherent to existence so one must meditate um, and remove themselves from the world essentially it's a it's a removal process from the world yeah. whereas christianity provides a way to embody this transcendental experience and go and put it into narrative action to go and invite the world to it and not to be proselytizing you know too much but but to but to participate in the divine narrative structure of life um mm, that i yeah. think buddhism kind of extracts out of the equation and says yeah. everything is fundamental to this transcendental state but no way by which to wrap that back into a continuing step story the story of what you're trying to maybe accomplish you know yeah yeah yeah, that's good. And I, it reminds me, I was reading, um, I don't know if you're familiar with Stanislav Grof. He's, um, he was very active in LSC therapy in the 50s and 60s. And um, I have a book of his um, called LSC Psychotherapy. And uh, he was talking about his, a lot of his patients, of course, I, a lot of these uh, trials were conducted at a mental hospital among schizophrenic patients. So the issue of consent you know, is definitely there, and that's sad to think about. But he was talking about how um, he, he his theory, his whole theory, well, he had these perinatal matrices, like he kind of filtered the whole um, psychedelic experience through the um, womb and birth process and postnatal process. And so it's, it's kind of interesting. I was really into it back in the day, but he was talking about how his theory was that um, his patients would essentially um, experience enough ego death that they would eventually emerge on the other side. Like there would be this, this like enlightenment point. I guess I don't know what you would call that, but the way that he described the so-called enlightenment, and I don't think he used that word, but it was, you know, it was like a common, like they would evolve to this point through the LSC therapy. And he was talking about the, the way he framed it was is like a very Eastern Buddhist way of framing it to me. He said that they would reach a point where um, basically like they would be able to see with clarity, like the yin and yang of life and how both are necessary and how tragedy, like they would even be able to see the dark aspects of light or the dark aspects of life in um, kind of a positive way. And like, it just struck me as I remember thinking, um you know trying to attain that attachment and trying to or detachment and trying to attain like i feel like christianity gave me that and gives us that liberty to be honest about like suffering is is suffering like it's terrible you know and i feel like buddhism the idea is to detach from suffering and the idea is to not experience suffering as suffering whereas christianity and as you said like i think for me the the human aspect of Jesus, that he was fully human, is more difficult for me to reckon with than the fact that he was fully God, because there's just something about him being fully human that disturbs me, and that that he suffered, like you said, in the most profound ways that a human being can suffer. Yet, at the same time, there's, I don't know, in Christianity, there's such a liberation to acknowledge, like, suffering is suffering, like, it's bad, it's not good, yet there is nowhere and this was also very comforting to me in my second to when i reflect on my psychedelic experiences and really for the first few years after i quit even though there was part of me that that loved that still like loved lsd and was almost sorrowful and like i grieved leaving it behind at the time but i was also so damaged by my years of use and the really bad experiences i've had i had that i didn't even really like to think about my trips for a long time but it was such a comfort to me to realize, um, like even on those bad trips, there is nowhere I can go. I could have gone that Jesus Christ had not also been, that God was also, you know, that God was not present. And so the idea of like God's redemption running that deeply, it was immensely, immensely comforting to me. And something that 
I did not find present at all in any of the Eastern philosophies that I studied. Well, that's, I like that. That's well said. Uh, it kind of encapsulates the whole, the whole idea too, that you had mentioned right there prior to that about the ego death and all these invoke mm -hmm. terminologies that are associated with psychedelics. Yeah. Um, they're kind of misleading in their, their language too, because it's not like this glorious experience to go and to go and transcend the self so many times that the ego becomes a figment as opposed to an actual active integral part of the self. Um, right. Because I, I, I sympathize or not sympathize, but I synergize a lot with what you say about ego death and have said in some of your writings and previous discussions and, and see it as like you had mentioned in one of your interviews, kind of talking about somebody like Timothy Leary, who became so ego death. He had so many ego deaths that he had the birth of the biggest ego anybody could have ever had, you know, to declare yeah. oneself the high priest, you know, of, of this chemical and, and all of yeah. those things, which are, those are inevitable byproducts of any, any big movement in social events. I mean, in the sixties, you're going to have somebody assume that role. It's just, if you have that big of a movement, somebody's going to capitalize on it monetarily and financially and try to use it to further an agenda of some type. And he happened to Timothy Leary, of course, being that, that, that person. And so there is a cautionariness to the tale of, of that story and learning from that history of, of what these have done. Um, yeah. But Oh, I can't hear you all of a sudden. Sorry, I had accidentally clicked mute there for a second. Oh, okay. Um, okay. I, uh, I, I wanted to ask you about that particular thing about the. Um... <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, That's okay. I, I have wanted... kids and dogs running around, so I'm. I hopefully I won't be interrupted at any point. Yeah, no problem. Um, I, uh, I wanted to try to see kind of how how you, if you've been able to utilize Christianity in a way that kind of merges that ego death type experience, I noticed a lot of the, the biblical writings and things actually do, do have some kind of references to that experience. And so it's not like divorced from yeah. Christianity is not so much divorced from these Eastern perspectives of the self being an illusion or transcendental arena, kind of when, when Jesus lectures or teaches and says, you know, the, the idea is to pick up your cross and follow him. It's kind of a, an, and, and kind of a, and a reference to me to like, you know, transcending at least the shame and the, the de deception of your past or, or the, the, the past, the self that's associated with what the flesh desires kind of, and, and Christ kind of provides that, that symbology. So I wanted to ask kind of to get this closer to what made kind of wanted to get to what made you want to write and um, were you interested in writing prior to these psychedelic experiences or these um, coming back to Christ and how, um, writing has helped you integrate that ego dissolution in a Christian framework. Yeah, yeah, and it's helped immensely. And I, I always. Um, oh, and I just wanted to say, I would, I would go even further with your statement. Like, the Christ is the symbology. Like, I think Christ is not only the symbology, but the reality behind that. And I think being able, yeah, writing about my second. And like I said, the book that I'm writing right now, um, I. Um, it, I don't know. It's been it's been um, painful in places to go back and really like deeply uh, reflect upon and revisit. I some of some of those aspects of the past and some of those seasons. I remember when I was taking um, probably about five or six months after I first took acid, and I got into a pattern of taking taking it pretty regularly, mostly by myself, and um, those ego deaths, like you said, you know, um, those repeated ego deaths, like that can be really brutal if you're doing that over and over again. I mean, for some people, it can be very disintegrative and brutal and psychologically damaging only one time. And um, for me doing that over and over again by myself and like, I was like kind of, con I was writing a novel at the time, uh, which I've gone back and read some of it and it's, it's not very good at all. But um I, I developed like this, own, like my own personal mythology that was like self-aggrandizing, but also like self-destructing. And um, the more I was taking acid and I was making art and I was writing, I was, I got kind of like weirdly, um, and with those repeated ego deaths, I felt like um, it was very um, disintegrative. <laughs> like I, I was, I was losing my mind basically is how I'd put it. Um, 
and going back and reading oh and i've been also like revisiting some of my my own personal people i regarded as my own personal prophets back then like ramdas alan watts and i was just this morning i was writing on a chapter and i was thinking about um i used to really really love uh philip k dick the science fiction writer and um he wrote a book called a scanner darkly which is um it, i mean it's science fiction like pretty much everything he wrote but um i think it he drew that novel from a lot of his own personal experiences with drugs and also being surrounded by a group of people who were drug users and there's actually a dedication at the back of the book to a number of people he knew who are had permanent psychosis or were deceased or uh, permanent brain damage but and i don't know if this was i don't think this was necessarily purely from psychedelics i think it was probably a constellation of a bunch of different types of drugs i don't know but um anyway i i had to get this book from the library again because i remember this part where um this one of the characters is um he decides that he's going to take his life and so he gets a handful of pills he, or he buys like you know a large quantity of pills from someone that he thinks are downers and he begins to he takes them all and he's lays down and waits thinking he's gonna you know fade into um oblivion and instead he begins hallucinating and this um creature appears in his room uh who has a scroll it's like a creature's head is covered with eyes and it has a scroll and um the this character who was going to kill himself says like um you're you're going to read all of my sins to me, aren't you? And the creature says, yes, that's why I'm here. Your sins are going to be read ceaselessly to you in shifts for all eternity. And so he then rolls the scroll and he said, and I mean, Philip K. Dick being who he was, like it, this scene is played like somewhat comically, but I just look back on that, that and think like, oh man, like that, you know, I had some experiences like that. And I think those experiences of like, repeatedly obliterating my ego or thinking that's what I was doing through psychedelics, like repeated, like that wasn't enough to um, save me, you know, however we're framing salvation. And I know that's an entire conversation, but um, like, I felt like, um, and I got to a point in, like I said, that time period where, where I felt like, I didn't want to be in my body anymore. And I felt like I was hurtling and there was always this urgency to it too with psychedelics. Like I felt like I was hurtling toward this destination. Um, and I wasn't sure what it was. I wasn't sure if it was enlightenment or just like the final, the final dissolution of my ego, like the final breaking on through to the other side <laughs> where everything. And so that was a, a salvific idea in a way that I would reach this like final omega point or wherever, whatever, where everything would be okay, whether that was, absorption into the all or the final ego death or or whatever um yet i found you know in between my trips like all these things like kept resurging you know like my past my sins like my as much as i tried i felt like i couldn't escape the burden of my sin essentially you know and so to have um jesus as this like deeply human figure who was also god which still just like blows my mind so much i can't you know i don't think any of us can fully comprehend that um who who was himself like the forgiveness who was himself like and like you said there are those um parables in the bible and jesus himself tells the parable you know unless the seed or says unless the seed falls to the ground and dies like it's not going to produce fruit like there are all those parables but they're they're encapsulated in the person of christ so i think like the ego death that i experience with psychedelics and the ego death and or the kind of death and dying to self that is portrayed in eastern traditions i feel is foundationally different from the ego death or whatever you want to call it in the the dying to self that is with jesus christ oh that i agree with you 100 percent. i think that like you said that and we were talking about the coupling of narrative and truth and it's once you realize these insightful truths about the nature of 
what seems to come is not so much religious in nature. It's more so kind of psychedelics and meditation and these, these, into, these introspective metacognition practices where you're thinking about self in a viewpoint of other um, in a way where you can think about thinking, um, which it seems to be a unique component to human nature, um, the metacognitive ability to, to speak of I and myself as yeah. two characters um, embodying the same, the same ideals. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think that a lot of times those insights, when they come, it's easy to find your way to Eastern culture because of how much they wrote about that as being the basis of society, basis of their religious framework. Yeah. But then whenever you, like you said, whenever you experience those ego deaths and everything like that, there becomes a need almost to couple yourself back with something that's meaningful because it can, because mm. I had seen a podcast you were a part of that was kind of the, the title on it was kind of transcending a nihilistic viewpoint, a meaninglessness feeling of existence. Yeah. And I think that the dangers of not dangers, but uh, the potential pitfalls that are associated with psychedelics and meditative practices that may come unsuspecting to some people when they begin the practice is the net, the, the necessary aspect of, we're generally in the West not associated with this ultimate oneness mentality. We have more of a capitalistic self against other, you know, trying to always step on the foe of our, of our destiny to get one step higher is kind of, yeah. and not, not to, not to say that's bad or better or worse than any other type of political system, but it is less predisposed to those experiences of integrating transcendence because we're not used mm -hmm. to the loss of self nearly as much as in the East. And so, we we desire probably to once we've realized the state of oneness what what i find uh, integral at least in my experience of of having of wanting to write afterwards writing kind of came to me to do whenever i was able to couple the suffering with with christ because it was able to put forth or put aside all of the shame that would normally be associated with writing about these experiences yeah. and yeah. so you you're used to kind of not of filtering all these stories and filtering all of this um, potential material through this societal filter that, you know, you want to be presented in a certain light right. and the shame, and it's almost like Christ, you know, he reading his story and trying to mesh that with my story. There became a point where I realized, okay, I can transcend all the shame because this guy, mm -hmm. this person already came here and took care of it. Yeah. Um, and then something transformative enough to where I just, I was, I wanted to write as I thought I wanted to write my thoughts and didn't really care any longer. So my ego death more to me was the dissolution of my own self talk that would constantly eliminate my desire to write. So I wanted to ask you kind of yeah. was, is that shame and that removal of shame that comes with Christ's story? Um, and then coupling that with your own, was that, did that allow you to kind of springboard your writing in a more of a direction that you wanted it to go? Yeah, absolutely. A hundred percent. And that I love what you say about that. I mean, I, it's so true. And the, the shame, that's a very good, I mean, word. Like <laughs> that was something that I felt like kept, um, kept returning to me despite the ego deaths and despite the meditation and despite the yoga, like it, it, it felt inescapable. It felt like there was no remedy for it. And, and it's been really interesting writing this book, you know, when I've got gotten pretty deeply into that season where I was, I was quite unhinged. And in addition to the psychedelics, I would also take speed, not at the same time. I was very strict about that, but, um, I was, I was a speed addict in addition to being, I, I would say addicted to psychedelics. I know some people would argue that psychedelics are non-addictive. Um, I don't think they're addictive in the same way <laughs> that other narcotics are, but I think, I was absolutely addicted to the experience. Um, and um, yeah, but writing about some of those, you know, I've written some things and I'm like, oh, like, I don't really know if I want people to know about this. My mom might read, you know, my poor mother. Um, but, you know, um, I feel like in Christ, we're liberated to be like, um, and like you said earlier about like joining in this narrative that God is weaving. And it's like, I don't have to, I don't have to worry about like uncovering my shame. I don't have to worry about, I don't have to, I don't have to conduct image control anymore, <laughs> you know, like I don't. And of course there are like, I tend to be very um, vulnerable um, with, in my friendships and even in writing and my husband's a very private person. So I have to try to take that into account. And of course there are different levels of vulnerability there, you know, there are some things that, um, I'll never put in writing that I've talked to my therapist about or my husband about, you know. Um, but I think overall, yeah, it's been like 
intensely liberating to, um, yeah, to know that, that I am forgiven in a way that transcends any kind of um, human accusation or <laughs> transcends any kind of self-consciousness. And um, also that like, it's not um, my shame and my, and also to know that, um, what is Paul? The Apostle Paul says, um, like, what does he say about, um, like, it is a reliable, reliable saying, like, Jesus Christ came to, came, came to save sinners of whom I am the worst. And like, just reading through the biblical narratives, I mean, like the depths of betrayal, like I think a lot about Peter, you know, he swore up and down. That was the one thing he would never do was betray Jesus. And then like right away, like immediately turns around and, and does it. And uh, and then, of course, the Apostle Paul was murdering Christians. So um, just to know that, like, I think I used to I used to feel like my my darkness and my shame and my sin is like somehow somehow darker than everyone else's, you know, and just have that liberation. Like, no, it's not like, this is the human condition. Like everyone has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so, and also like framing, like I am sharing this for a purpose. Like I am sharing this in order to tell this narrative in order to join in the narrative, the redemptive narrative that God is telling, you know, like there, it is purposeful. Like it's not, you know, um, and I think, yeah yeah writing i feel like and i feel like i don't i wonder if you feel this way like sometimes i sit down to write with a with an idea in my head of what i'm going to write. i usually have some big idea of what i'm going to write but then sometimes when i sit down i and start to write i feel like things emerge or things go in a different direction you know completely different direction that i had planned so it's like i can feel the holy spirit moving through through writing for me i guess you know and i'm sure that's true for a painter or you know somebody who plays soccer really well or you know whatever but like i can feel that um like what's that um yeah i i, I know what you mean i know I, I know you're searching for kind of the word there but i, I didn't yeah. mean to interrupt you but um no, no, yeah no. i i think that your portrayal um there with with writing relating back to kind of how the spirit can move move a person and it seems it's not trivial to say or not too metaphysical even to make a claim like that because even if you remove the the spiritual or religious aspects from it as a scientist person would do to try to analyze well writing is thought you know it they would have an explanation for this that would kind of they could get rid of any associate and and i don't like and I don't want that to become the norm because it, it is as scientifically as you could describe it. The process still becomes, like you said, transformative as you write the, the ideology that you're trying to put down. You don't even know that that's your thoughts. And sometimes right. at least I've noticed that as I develop a topic and if I pick a word or something, what I've been doing a lot when I write is picking an, an abstract word like authenticity or transcendence and trying to develop them my idea of what that word really carries in my life. Um, because a lot of times I'll find myself describing that for three or four pages and realizing, wow, I didn't even realize that a lot of these thoughts I had were so cohesively joined together because before they were kind of floating around in this thought sphere of potential ideologies I could develop for myself on how I view my percep my perception of the world and reality. Um, but I didn't know that those were as deeply intertwined with a lot of other thoughts and concepts I had been having in, as well. And so it's kind of like weaving this thread of, of insightful wonder through a long kind of flowing thought dialogue with yourself in a way. But like you said, I find something unique about language and putting your thoughts into language that begets further insights almost. It's almost like a requisite requirement to developing your own thoughts to seeing how they work. Um, because a lot of times, like you said, I find this, the narrative writing itself in a way and it's almost like, okay, well, I'm not, I don't want to take even really much credit for this because it doesn't yeah. seem like something I had even right. really thought about. And so yeah. I think that's a testament, like you had said, maybe to what the spirit is and what it does and its interrelationship between, you know, in the Bible, it says in the beginning was the word and then Christ was the word made, made flesh. It, the, something about words and language that is intrinsically unique to humanity and to self yeah. um, and as the human animal and the human species. And it being the word incarnate, being Christ, to me, I think that language was intentionally hum human 
and uniquely human for a purpose. And so I think it's yeah. it's something biblical and theological to say that, yeah, the, that putting words to language in a way that can be left behind for others is yeah. uniquely Christian in a way. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's so good what you said about, like, you find the narrative writing itself. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. you know, you feel like you can't even take credit for it. Like, I feel that way sometimes. Absolutely. And yeah, it being unique to Christianity. And I hadn't thought of that in a long time. The at the beginning of the Gospel of John is like one of my favorite passages in the Bible. Um, but yeah, that is that there is something, I mean, absolutely uniquely human and even uniquely Christian, but I'm sorry, my dog is in my face. No problem. <laughs> hey, Izzy, can you take the dog and put him on the tether, please? Thank you. Okay, sorry. <laughs> no problem. Uh, but yes, I uh, I agree with you, and I I think that I think that the unique part of Christianity is to bring back in to the to the, the suffering and the truth that's found through these transcendental experiences. Christianity provides a conduit to reintegrating that into being and writing, especially the the, the way in which you write. Like I, I write about, or I read your article where you talk about hope and how waiting and hope are coupled together. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was an article you had written for. I can't remember. I had read it a few days ago and. Um, found it really neat just the way in which a word like hope, it's almost like you developed an entire idea around hope. And, and I, I find that really cool. I find that kind of how I, I've kind of adjusted my writing style to being is yeah. finding um, an, an abstract noun or an abstract way of feeling that is kind of indescribable in a certain way. Like when you attempt to describe things like virtue or faith or hope, it becomes a, a tall task to do. Um, if you try to get down to the root of what these things come from and where the where's the essence that radiates this um, altruistic spirit that otherwise probably wouldn't have come into being through simplistic biological evolution. That's kind of the conclusions that because I was a very scientifically minded person that found my way back to Christianity in a similar way, psychedelics being a portion of that process. And I came to the conclusion that things like faith and hope and and resilience and um transcendence and all of these terms are indescribable without religious language yes. first of all and it did yeah. because you get out of your sphere of reality so far that spiritual language even an atheist would use to put words to these kinds of experiences yeah, and so i began to question a lot of the premises of science um in a scientific way too because that's kind of the spirit of science is to challenge the, the prerequisite held beliefs and i came to a conclusion that things like hope empathy faith and altruism those kinds of abstract where somebody prioritizes other over self in a way that that's not really convenient. That's not really a very uh, synergistic kind of philosophy with natural selection and evolution by itself. Yeah. And so I yeah. kind of, I kind of wanted to ask you as before, before you found your way back to religion and, and everything, did it, did it reinvigorate your creativity? You feel like too, as far as insightful ideas that come to you, like do you were, do you think that, you know, when you put your faith in something higher than yourself and, and acknowledge that you know nothing really at all, um, that that kind of brings forth further knowing almost that's kind of the understanding or the wisdom that's talked about in, in the book of Job, per se, per se, in the Bible? Yeah, absolutely. And I love everything you just said. And I, I can tell, like, you're very scientifically minded and highly intelligent. And like, like some things you say are so brilliant. I have to think about them for a second. But I love what you said about... Um, the what do you say about like um choosing like those abstract concepts or those words and then yeah. writing about them and how and i feel like that that is a way of kind of like grounding them in reality and like seeing the way and for me too it's like seeing how god works in the world and i feel like it almost made me think of or it did make me think of um that really that really wonderful phrase that your friend used about the decoupling of narrative and reality. I feel like that's the like recoupling <laughs> of reality with truth. And um, like sometimes it can feel as though, um, and I've had, I have had some, you know, it's obviously it's not like since I became a Christian, um, life has been ideal. Like, and I have had some um, episodes of a fairly severe mental illness since then. And during those times, I've, you know, been flooded with doubt and had 
specifically i have struggled with the doubt like am i just telling like are we just telling ourselves a story with christianity yeah. a story that's are we imposing a story upon this chaos <laughs> that is not but um i know like i don't think so i think like we are reminding ourselves of truth and like we are like and i feel like writing in particular like is a way in which like the beauty of God's redemption and how he works can kind of like become clarified for me and like coalesce for me. Um, and I am so sorry. I completely lost. What was the last question that you asked? Sorry. Oh no, no <laughs> problem. Back and responding to something that you said earlier. And what was the final, what was the end of that? Oh, I was, I was asking kind of, uh, did you, did you think you were on the receiving end more, um, of insightful things um like oh. did your understanding and your wisdom increase your creativity as you've relinquished some of that what you previously held as kind of control over your life you know whenever yeah. you acknowledge a higher power it seems like that mutualistic relationship between the higher power and yourself isn't something that brings you up egoically by any means in fact yeah. it's it brings you down but as it brings you back up out of that that trials and that suffering that process of of coming back out of that is like this dialogical thing between you're you're almost given insightful insightful things to think about um unique things to write about like maybe your, your my creativity at least seemed to kind of increase as i began to admit that i didn't really know anything <laughs> yeah right right yeah and i one of my favorite passages in the bible is um i think it's first corinthians chapters one and two where he talks about um like god has used the foolish things of the world to shame the wise like and it, it pleased god to do this and like the the foolishness of God is wiser than the wisdom of the world, I think is the verse. And so, yeah, I feel like my journey into, I feel like, um, and I feel like it's, it's hard to say, like you were talking about Timothy Leary earlier, like, I don't know that I can necessarily say it's symptomatic of psychedelics or like a consequence of psychedelics, but like that, that high priest, type like that does emerge a lot you see and so and i knew some people like that like my friend that i mentioned earlier who kind of prided himself on introducing people to psychedelics um and so i feel like ironically like my on, on one hand i went through all these pummeling ego deaths but i also had so much arrogance um about well particularly i had so much arrogance about about spiritual knowledge like i felt like i I knew something, even if I couldn't necessarily articulate it, like I, I knew something that people who took, who had not take, taken psychedelics did not know, you know, and therefore I had this spiritual superiority. And in particular, like I was so, um, just so opposed to Christianity in every way. Like I was just so antagonistic and, and it was ironic because I had been, I had been kind of a militant, maybe perhaps not as militant as some, but a fairly militant atheist um prior to taking psychedelics and i was really into um christopher hitchens which i think he's kind of fallen out of favor a little bit along with most of the other new atheists even among atheists but i was actually writing an essay recently for a collection and i i a collection of essays that was centered around people who um were atheists and became christians and for whom the new atheist, one of the one or more of the new atheists figured somehow in their journey. And I remember I was big on Christopher Hitchens and so, and so going back and reading his, I read his, I, I didn't read the whole thing from cover to cover, but it was just too painful. But I read some of his book, God is not great. And like, it's just fascinating, like the things that at the time seemed so sophisticated to me and such so clever, like just seemed like, so simplistic and elementary and you know and so um it was like i feel like christianity has blown my mind open in a whole way that even psychedelics never could and i do feel like the process into christianity and to becoming you know to dying with christ which is an ongoing process but it's just like one big humbling basically and I feel like too, for me, psychedelics, um, my love for psychedelics, my passion for psychedelics, a lot of it was based around a hunger for knowledge and a hunger for a hunger for wisdom, but just like a hunger for knowing and a hunger for understanding, which I don't think that's, you know, I'm not saying that's inherently sinful. I think for me, it, it, it turned that way. And then I got a lot 
and I think this is common with psychedelics, you get a lot more knowledge than you bargained for and some of it's knowledge that you wish you never had. Um, but, and so I feel like, like, yeah, absolutely. Like what you say, like surrendering to a higher power and um, surrendering to the reality that not only do I not know everything, I can't know everything. And that's actually a good thing. And that's a blessing. Um, and so, yeah, I do feel like I have um, deeper insights that I can't necessarily take credit for. Like you were saying, you know, sometimes we write things that I think like that didn't really come from me. You know, that certainly wasn't generated from um, my own knowledge or my own wisdom. Um, and so, so yeah, yeah, I guess to answer that question, like, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's a, that's a, I really liked what you said too, because I, I was a disciple almost of a lot of those newer atheist types, especially mm -hmm. Christopher Hitchens because of his eloquence, yeah. because yeah. of his scientific demeanor, the way he carried himself and his, mm -hmm. he was so convicted of his beliefs too, the way he spoke, yeah. the way he handled yeah. himself. It wasn't like he needed to prepare lecture notes to go and debate right. one of the he most, could just like, yeah. he could he just rattle very, off all of his bright, thoughts. Very clever. And he could, and he could, I think I liked how he could just take people down like that, you know, um, but yeah, there was something about his, um, his candor and his delivery and, and the way he carried himself that was attractive to the atheistic types too, because ultimately you're trying to succumb to, you're trying to overthrow God when you're an atheist, that, that vehemently of an atheist, you're trying to put, you know, God, but Frederick Nietzsche, one of the philosophers would, would write before in the past kind of that God is dead because we've killed him essentially. And what, what essentially those atheistic dialogues are occurring, it's almost like you're trying to catapult the human above all understanding and as you do that inevitably you're going to need a character with a personality and a persona that is bigger than life essentially and the new atheist found that in a character like hitchens who could balance out the the laid-back demeanor of somebody like sam harris who would bring everybody to the edge of transcendence but not fully to the belief in in, mm. in uh, transcendental being to purvey the instructions you know and so i um I find it interesting what you say about Christopher Hitchens because inevitably people arrive at him and especially people trying to justify their unbelief. You're going to arrive at somebody like him who can put that, those concepts into words. But what I find the most intriguing is how you said going back to those now, it seems so like they're missing the point almost like we're not, they're arguing against a non, a non needed argument. Um, <laughs> right. it, yeah. It's like, <laughs> I'm not talking about God that you're talking. I'm not talking. Yeah, of course he's a, you know, so it just starts to, it's an interesting framework shift, uh, consciousness shift almost that I'm not saying that, that it, it's an elevatory shift that it's bringing you above other, or that it's just a lateral movement of how you think, who knows if one is better than the other. And I would, would not put myself on a spot to say that it's better to have these experiences and to think this way, but it is a very intriguing landscape, land shift, landscape altering um, paradigm yes. that that's almost like, okay, my brain used to be oriented to perceive the world in this way and understand the fabric of reality to be this. And now I look at something and it's completely different in how I internalize its, its uh, existence almost. And so yeah. Yeah. I find that it's interesting that, that as you, as you relinquish these, these kinds of thoughts about self being able to conquer all and begin to realize that we don't really know anything, you start to rebuild up from the depths of that abyss of suffering. You start to be rewarded through wisdom. And, and as in the Bible, of course, like in the book of Job, he's trying to convey the nature of suffering and the philosophical mm -hmm. understanding of why humans. And he does that by explaining over and over again, at least the God of the old Testament explaining to Job that, you know, understanding and wisdom are fearing the Lord, you know, and relinquishing yeah. self essentially. Yeah. And so he, it kind of seems to me that the Bible offers, not necessarily going to promote you financially. It's not going to give you, you know, as you follow God, you're not going to be elevated societally, but you will be granted potential, you know, the understanding that can allow you to help others. So I think the Christian religion ultimately does allow one, if you have that transcendent experience to read the writings of Jesus. And if you're going to take them seriously, you're going to have to humble yourself to even follow those teachings, mm -hmm. to get close to what he means. You have to humble yourself, but also still value your selfhood as an agent in the world, um, but not but not completely obliterate your your meaning. But also, if you want to take the writings of Christ seriously, it inevitably requires a massive humbling of your personality. Just when you read what he says, you're not really allowed to, to promote self anymore if you want to take Jesus seriously. And, and right. it seems like yeah. you can reap rewards in that just in, in inner peace. And, and as you write, you can 
you can, you know, kind of demonstrate some of those gifts of understanding and wisdom that, that was kind yeah. of given to you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, I loved what you said about, um, about the arguments of Hitchens kind of, and I, and I say this, like you said, you know, I, I don't want to say this with arrogance or any, any, um, lack of humility whatsoever. And like, I say this in love because I, I adored Christopher Hitchens, you know, but, but that like, there is that sense when I go back and read him of like, profoundly missing the point, you know, yes. and like yeah. he said, like, yeah, yeah. And it's just kind of painful to read like, and he's so, he's so impassioned and he was so eloquent and so quick and so witty. Um, but yeah, there's that sense of like profoundly, profoundly missing the point. Yeah, I agree a hundred percent. And yeah. I think that, I think that by doing what you're doing and, and writing about these experiences with such candor and candidness and in your experiences, as, um, as we were talking about earlier, the, the removal of that shame and kind of the lifting of the ability to censor yourself, to really get the correct story of how you've gotten to where you are out there, is such a necessary um, tool to aiding in the integrative component of other people's experiences. It's the sharing and the dialogical component of what just the amount of podcasts you've been on, the amount of articles you've written with such candor is, is reaching, I think, a lot of people, but especially just subjectively myself, it's nice to be able to read something somebody else has experienced and see it to such a, which is again, going back to the coupling of narrative and truth and, and being able to identify with another story that really helps integrate your own story. And there's a cyclical feedback loop of that kind of between people that I think is necessary to helping others integrate these wildly in vogue mindfulness meditation experiences, psychedelic experiences. And so, um, I just kind of wanted to say thank you for your efforts and thank you for your putting your writing out there and sharing your story like you have. And ultimately, thank you for coming on today and talking um, as much as we have. Um, yeah. I feel like we could talk for a long time in the future. So I hope, you know, yeah. as you as you get your book developed and all of that, I hope we can speak between now and then. Um, yeah. But I just wanted to say I, I think that it was a good dialogue um, and I didn't want to keep you too long, but I really appreciate your time. And um, I look forward to all your future work and look forward to talking to you again in the future. Thank you so much. Well, I really, I really enjoyed it. Yeah, it was a great conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ashley. Uh, we'll talk again soon, but uh, until then, uh, I look forward to your work as it comes out and uh, take care. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.